Um, all right, so Memorial Day, let's take a look in what God remembers. Now, let's start with a great verse. This isn't even one of my things, but just look in uh, uh, he, Hosea chapter 12 to start this morning. Hosea, just with a little time here, we'll look at some things that God says he thinks is a, something to be memorialized, something to be remembered. I had a, I had a, I had a, reason I was telling that story, I completely forgot. It was to lead into something else, but but the Lord had, has mercy on you through the week, amen? But we do little things to remember. We have little keepsakes you hold on to, things to remember your loved ones when they pass away. You look at it from time to time, and the Lord he had some things he said, I want you to build something here. I want you to build an altar. I want you to do this. I want you to build this or make this. And I want you to remember me. Remember my word. And uh, the Lord himself is a memorial. I'm looking in Hosea chapter 12, verse 3. And it says, he took his brother by the heel. He's talking about Jacob. He took uh, Esau. By the heel and by his strength, he had power with God. There was something impressing God already in the womb. <laughs> Just the fact that he grabbed him by the foot. He was a fighter. And he, yea, he had power over the angel. He took the angel and grabbed him too. You know, this is, that's some great, right there's something to think about this morning. You got to grab on to some things and remember some things and hold on to it dearly. Grab your Bible. Love that Bible. Don't let people hoodwink you to get rid of your King James Bible because they made a new King, that ain't the new King James Bible. Any changes between the new King James and the King James are a whole different family of manuscripts. It wasn't like they said, let's just make it more modern. They inserted false readings into your King James Bible. Have nothing to do. In fact, the new King James is worse than the NIV because you think, oh, I'm reading the King James. No, that's a deception. That's like one of these, what they call uh, something drugs. What do they call that? Like a a gateway drug, uh, you know, Kratom. You ever heard of Kratom? How many heard of Kratom? Okay, well, you don't know. That's the thing kids are taking now. It's like you can get it at the supermarket. You can get it at the gas station. Kratom. And uh, it's, they're selling that stuff around. It's a, it's a gateway thing. And you start taking that, start marijuana's next. Marijuana, then what? Cocaine or Whatever, you end up on uh, bath salts, you know, standing in Philadelphia. These people stay. Ever watch that? You know, do you good? Look on YouTube and look up uh, Philadelphia bath salts and see what's going on in America. People are just standing there like this on the street. Hours like this. Look at, uh, I forget what street it's called, uh, uh, Kensington Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, all over the streets. I mean, you go to Seattle or up in Portland. Tent cities and defecation on the sidewalks. You can go, Ovalda's a problem. Yeah, there's problems in America, but there's bigger problems going on in this country because there's, there's no leadership and they got rid of their Bible and they took the Bible out of the schools. And so now you got people on bath salts and losing their brains. And, but these are called uh, gateway. What was I talking about here? Gateway. Uh, get rid of your King James Bible. Take a new King James Bible. Yeah, that's the devil, just trying to get rid of the church, get rid of its, the precious promises. And this is what we're looking at, God's word. And it says here, get a hold of something. That's why God loved Jacob. He loved him in the womb. He foresaw what he would be like. He had power not only over his brother Esau, grabbing him by the heel. He grabbed the angel and said, I won't let you go until you bless me. And he prevailed. He wept. I mean, he's crying out to God, weeping and praying. And made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel. You got to find God. You got to get a hold of God in your prayers. And there he spake with us. You know what it is? You got to have some moments in life where you meet with God. And you made a pact with God. And you got on an altar. And you said, God, I'm surrendered. God, I'll go. Lord, you got my whole heart. That's a memorial. You remember that day. 
You should remember the day you got saved. You, that's a memorial day. That's a moment wherever you were at the day you got saved. You ought to think about that and say, thank you, Lord. I remember that day. I know that place. I don't remember, maybe don't know the day or what day of the week it was, Wednesday or Saturday. But I know, God, in my heart, I knew I had a covenant with God. He went to Bethel. That's where he built an altar. He had visions of the ladder going up, Jacob's ladder, and the angels ascending, descending on that. Jake, and he built an altar there, the house of God, Bethel. God, God met me here. It's his house. And there he spake with us, even the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial. I want to start with that. The Lord's our memorial. We ought to remember the Lord in everything in our life. You ought to think about God in every aspect of your life. If you don't think of God and realize what he's done for you, you forget what God's done for you, don't forget. Don't ever forget what God's done for you. All right, number one, look over here uh, to Exodus chapter 3. Here's what God said I want you to remember, my name. He made his name known to us, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jehovah saves. Jesus Christ. What a wonderful name. Exodus chapter 3. Ischud 3. Adin do dua. We're talking about a memorial. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. This would be a place of memorial. There's a bush that never burned. What is that bush a picture of? What, when you think of those two words, a bush was not consumed. Take those two little words right there. And that will trigger something in your mind. The Bible says, uh, precept upon precept, line upon line. That's how you study your Bible. What you do is you take words. And here's two words that are very interesting. Something was not consumed. So you say, well, what is that bush a picture of? What is that? Why did God do that? Why did God appear in a bush? What is that bush? Well, okay. What, what do you think of? Who got a verse? Who, what do you think? Not consumed. Anybody think of one? Okay, look at Malachi. It's the first thought I came across my mind when I think of that memorial. We're going to look at a memorial here. Malachi. That's near the end of the Bible. I'm in the Old Testament Bible, the Jewish Bible. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Great verse. It's a promise of God. He said, I will never change. I am God yesterday. I'm the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. He says, I made a covenant with Abraham. I made a covenant with his seed, Isaac, and with Jacob, I made a covenant. And you know what he said in the covenant? Verse 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are what? Not consumed. Didn't the Bible say our God is a what? For our God is a consuming fire. So he chose not to consume Israel. He said, you won't be consumed. That's that burning bush. God chose a people, a nation, to be with them. That's the chosen people, Israel. And they are still here today. The nations hated them, tried to destroy them. The czars, the European nations, France, England, they were hated everywhere. Pogroms, and they still endure because God made a promise. That's to prove God's power. That's to prove God's word is true. Say, are they so much better? No, they're sinners like us. They're not sinners of the Gentiles, but they're sinners. They go to hell. Jews who don't believe on Jesus, they go to hell. But God made a covenant with Abraham and said, I change not. And I made a promise to you that your seed will last forever. And you will be my people and I will be your God. And I'll bless them that bless thee and I'll curse them that curse thee. And all those nations that curse the Jews, look at them today. And look what happened to the nations that touched God's apple of his eye. You know, that's the bush. And so go back to Exodus chapter 3. There's another one in Leviticus, I mean, uh, Lamentations. I can't remember. It says, uh, his mercies they fail not, therefore ye are not consumed. 
Remember we say, how great, great is thy faithfulness comes from those words. Beautiful song. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. And you look at those words there. It says morning by morning. It's in the Levitic, I mean uh, Lamentations, I think chapter 3, probably verse 11 or something, because those, each of those chapters is like 22 verses, and one of them is 66. It's kind of like the Bible all in a numerical nutshell. Each chapter in Lamentations, is, the Lord did the Bible perfectly. And so you look at that thing, 22, 22, something like 66, 22, 22. And in the middle of that one chapter, the Lord says, you're not consumed because of my mercies. He made promises of mercy to Abraham and his seed. He made promises to you of mercy. Amen? You have a promise from God. You'll never go to hell. You'll never burn in the fire. It will not consume you. Amen? <laughs> that ought to get you excited. You're, you're, you will never be consumed by God's wrath because you have the mercies of God upon you. It says, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath uh, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according to his mercy. Amen? According to his mercy. The reason you're not going to hell is by God's mercy. And so that burning bush is a memorial. Look at verse 15. Exodus, chap Exodus chapter 3 verse 15. Well let's start in 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say unto me, What is his name? They yet didn't know his name. What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That's one of the seven all capital phrases in the Bible. That's an inscription. When you see it all capitalized like that, one of them is on, on uh, Aaron's bonnet on, on the high priest. It said, Holiness unto the Lord. One of them is on the cross of Christ where it says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. One of them was in Mars Hill where it says, to the unknown God. <laughs> Another one is over there in Revelation 17 where it says, mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All caps. That's an inscription on somebody or on some kind of piece of wood. This is an inscription. It's all caps. I am that I am. You know what that meant? It, what it was translated into? Four letters. Uh, yod he wow he. That's what that is. And they took the four letters from I am that I am and made the word Jehovah out of it. That's where the word Jehovah shows up first in the Bible. Right here. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. God revealed his name right there, first time in the Bible. And it was called, it's called the Tetragrammaton. That means, tetras means four. Gramma, writing, the letters. Four letters. And they have vowel markings now, but no one knows the vowel markings. God didn't reveal the vowel markings. We say Jehovah in the King James Bible. Thank God we know the vowel markings because we have a King James Bible. Amen. But the Jews, it, it's Yahovah. Yehiwu, you don't know. It's not in there. It's just the four letters. It's called the Tetragrammaton. That's a name for it. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. That's a memorial. You ought to remember God's name. You ought to remember that God's promise that you'll never be consumed like that burning bush. He said, remember this bush. It signifies something, Moses. This is a memorial. I met with you and I told you my name. And I made known my name unto you. And you go and tell him, I am. That's what I am. <laughs> I don't need a name. I'm not a man. I am. I'm God. I am. That's all I, it matters. And Jesus said seven times in the book of John, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. You read that. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying, I'm God. Whenever they came to take him in the garden, 
the soldiers and Judas kissed Jesus on the cheek, and they said, "Art, you know, they art thou?" He, he said, "I am." And you know what happened when he said, "I am"? That's right. It knocked him back. He said to the Pharisees, "He said before Abraham was what? That ain't good. That ain't proper." English, if you're just saying a sentence that don't make no sense, but when he's saying, I am, I'm, I'm Jehovah, then it makes sense. That's why they wanted to stone him. He said, before Abraham was, he should have said, I was, right? But he didn't say that. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I didn't have a beginning. I'm without end of days. I had no father, no mother. I have no beginning nor end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am. And they hated him for saying that. Before Abraham was... I am. You're saying you're God? They took up stones. Yeah, they wanted to kill Jesus Christ because he was God in the flesh. Amen. He, we're serving the God, a great name. You know who your God is. Amen. And you have a promise from him. Look in Exodus chapter 12. We're looking at memorials. That burning bush is a memorial. You ought to have a memorial where God says you'll never burn. You're saved. Amen. Aren't you glad you're saved? You'll never burn. You'll never be consumed because God's mercy is greater than all your sin. You trusted him and you know his name. He wrote his name in your heart. Look in Exodus chapter 12 now, not far away. A couple. This is the Passover. This is the night when God delivered them. And it's a picture of Christ. And verse 12 through 14. And this thing is it's transitional. If you look at... Um, Verse 3, at the end there, it says, you shall take, it says, a lamb. And uh, then you go to verse 4, and it says, the lamb. And then you go to verse 5, and it says, your lamb. See how that becomes personal? He says there, a lamb for a house, end of verse 3. And if the house will be too little for the lamb, you got to know who the lamb is. That's Jesus. It's not just any lamb. It's not just a lamb. He is a lamb. Jesus became a lamb. He was a lamb. But he is the lamb. That's in Revelation. He was worthy to take the book and open the seals. The lamb of God, which is able to take the book and open the seals. Thank God for the lamb. But you know what? He needs to become your lamb. You better take him into your home and make it personal. He says, your lamb shall be without blemish. If you don't know him as your own personal savior, you're going to hell. He's not just, he is the lamb of God, but he is, he better be your lamb. Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, boy, that's, we sing that in a hymn, amen. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. You ought to underline that in your Bible. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's salvation right there. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. But it transferred in the New Testament. Christ, our Passover, was... Uh, what does it say? Sacrificed for us. What does it say? Christ our Passover. So the Jews should have that perpetual, eternal Passover. They should receive Christ. When you receive Christ, you have a memorial. You have something in your heart forever. God noted that. God wrote, he said, I wrote your name down. There's a new name written down in heaven. When the day you receive Christ, God put your name in the book of life. He memorialized it. He said, you're mine. You're one of Christ. You've received Christ. You have the blood and I will pass over you. Thank God for that blood, that precious blood. You will never, uh, God will remember you. God will say, you're blood bought. Amen. That's a memorial, that testimony. The Jews had a, a lamb and that when you receive Christ, you have a memorial forever. God says, I, I wrote it down. And uh, there's, there's no way you can ever change it. He wrote your name down. Look at the third one now. 
um, chapter 13. Go over one chapter. Now there's something after the Passover. It's called unleavened bread. We are going to take the Lord's Supper today. And that's a memorial. And we take it as the Jews did in the Old Testament. They did it as a part of their works. They were saved by faith with works. They had to go to the temple. They had to offer up sacrifice for sin. They had to uh, keep the law and the Ten Commandments. And so they were under the law. And the uh, Lord gave them this thing here. Look in chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. And he says, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no unleavened bread be seen with thee. That's kosher. The Jews of this day have to keep their house clean on, during that. No regular bread in their homes. They've got to clean their house. They've got to scrub every pot. They've got to clean their oven out. And they wash and clean. Make sure that it takes days to do it. <laughs> and uh, I guess it's just kind of a kill two birds with one stone. They do all their spring cleaning. I guess that's why we do spring clean, because those Jews, they will clean their refrigerator, any place where food's been, and cupboards, they clean them out. And he says, Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in that day. This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign unto me, thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes. And now this one you say, well, what's that a picture of? Well, the Jews have a thing where they, they take a, a leather strap and they wrap it around their arm, on their right arm, and they, and they have a box right here. And inside there is scripture portions. And then they take one and they have a box up here and they, it's like an amulet and they tie it on the, their head with straps and they have scripture right up in there. And that's a funny thing in the Bible. You're often going to see, uh, if thine eye offend thee, what does it say? Cut it out, right? If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. It's, it's weird, right? Why would the Lord say that? Well, them Jews in the tribulation, where are you going to put the mark? Either on the right hand or on the forehead. That's like the third eye. And the Lord said, I may, maybe there's a way out of that thing in the tribulation if you took the mark. I'm going to maybe grant a little indulgence there. <laughs> uh, you got to cut your right hand off. If you take that mark, you got to cut the hand off. That would be the only way. Or poke your eye, right eye out. <laughs> and that's, you know, the Antichrist over in, uh, I think, where's that at? Zechariah has a, with his right hand's, what does it say, withered or hurt? Wounded, right? On his right hand and his right eye. And uh, that's interesting. I can't get too deep into that right now. But there's something about the right arm of strength, the Lord's right hand of power, and that right eye, and that right here on the forehead. That's why you see the Hindus put a mark there. That's why the Catholics put a mark right there. And that's why the Antichrist is going to put a mark right there. The all-seeing eye, that third eye. That's your mind. That's saying, I'm willing to receive whatever false information. There's stuff going on right there. And uh, right here, the Jews, God says, I want you to put the Word of God right there. Put the Word of God in your mind. Have the Word of God in your hand. Carry your Bible. Have your Bible. Hold your Bible up. We go up there on Friday, you know what I do? I stand in the callous bell, and I just hold up my Holy Bible. And cars driving by, they're all excited about their, you know, red Mustang. And they're, I mean, it's fine to have a car, and it's great to drive around. I drive around callous bell cruise, too. I love it. I think that's great, but not too much interest in the Bible. Take your Bible and hold it up with your right hand. Amen. Get out there and show you're not ashamed of Jesus. And those Jews would wear a thing called a phylactery. That's what that's called. Look over in Matthew. It's actually in the Bible, Matthew 23, 5. Except they wanted to make people see how great they were, not how great God was. They made a show of their clothing and how much money they spent. Believe me, them Jews. I lived in Bensonhurst, New York. I had a house on 15, 15th Avenue and 73rd Street. I lived right on the border of Jewtown. And you go over there, and on a Friday evening, there ain't nobody in sight, man. It's Sabbath. And you might see a couple Uber drivers, you know, or a Mexican on a bicycle riding some pizza or something. <laughs> I mean, a kosher food or something from one of their 
nearby establishments, but it's deserted. It's New York City, three million, I mean, Brooklyn has three million people. That's three times the size of Montana population-wise, all in a little size of Kalispell. You think it's bad here now. Man, at least 15 cars at the light here on Reserve and Whitefish Stage Road. What's going on in this town? <laughs> go live in Brooklyn, man, the size of Kalispell with 3 million people. You'll go out of your mind. I did. I've been out of my mind since I moved there. That's a long time ago. So you wonder what happened to Pastor Keo. That tells you right there. I lived in Brooklyn for 12 years of my life. That'll drive you nuts. But them Jews over there, they, they wear those phylacteries. They get a black box on their forehead. And they wear these hats. They wear these hats made out of beaver or mink. I'm not lying. They're this big. And they're the shape of a ho hockey puck. And they walk around with a shiny black coat like this. And it goes all the way down to their ankles. And you've never seen anything odder in your life, man. It's like, let's see who's going to look the silliest in the world, you know. Who made God didn't tell him to do that. I mean, he said you're peculiar. But he said, I don't need you to be nuts about it. You know, he's like, I want, who made up the yarmulke? God didn't tell him to wear a yarmulke. I think it was a bald priest one time. He started wearing a little thing on the back there to cover it up. And all of his followers started doing it too. And it's like, oh, we got to wear the yarmulke now, you know. So some guy wore this hockey puck mink thing, you know. Those things cost easy $4,000, $5,000 like a mink coat. Yeah, that's a show off. And if you want to be in the ranks, you got to buy one of those. And they start them out. The women, all the women, they're beautiful hair, you know. You see, you see these married Jewish women in, in what's called Borough Park. And um, what's it called? Uh, it doesn't matter. But Williamsburg, New York, over in Queens. They had most beautiful hair. Well, you know, they're all bald. All those women shave their head and they all have to wear a wig. They're completely bald under that wig. It's another woman's hair. And they got a string about seven kids falling behind. She's pushing a buggy with two inside there. And they make a lot of babies, them Jews over there. But they got to cost a lot of money. And they all want to show. It's a show. Look in Matthew 23. He tells them, do what the, they say to you according to the law, verse 2, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Jesus is speaking. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy, heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. And lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will do not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. That's that thing they wear on their forehead. They, they, they probably spent money on it and made them bigger and more gold, you know, leaf on it. And God didn't ask them to do that. He did say to carry the word on them. Look over in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We've got to wrap up here pretty soon, but... You go to Israel today, and you go down to the Wailing Wall. I've been down there. I happened to be there on a, like a Yom Kippur, and they were all dancing, about 200 Jewish men singing in some Jewish song. It was pretty wild. And they get all frenzied, and they get into like a whirling dervish type of thing going on. Hey, uh, and they're going around like in a circle, and they're all dancing, and it's wild. It's fun. I almost wanted to jump in there, but I, I wasn't loud. But... Uh, you get down there, and they all got those little straps around their wrist, and a box on here, and a box up here. And the Bible says they were supposed to do something like that. Numbers, Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 8. And it says, and thou shalt, what is he talking about? His words. Look at verse 6. And these words, <laughs> which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Those are the good times to read your Bible. Talk about it in the morning, when, in the evening. That's what he's saying here. When thou walkest by the way, talk about the Bible. And when thou shalt bind, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. That's that phylactery. They started doing that. They kept God's word in, in their forehead with a little box. Say, oh, I need to read God's word. And they'd pull it out in a little scroll. I had one in my house in Brooklyn. They have a little thing. I forget what they call it. It's a little, a little thing. that It's a blessing inside of it. And you open up a little door, and there's scripture in there. And the Lord make his face, the Lord bless thee and make his face to shine upon thee and give thee peace. Uh, you ever read that? And it's one of those blessings. <clears throat> it's like the Bible. Look in uh, Exodus chapter 17. Go to Exodus 17. 
Go back a book to in Exodus 17. Look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. That's what the Bible is. It's a, a more memorial. This is what Moses wrote. He wrote the five books of the, of the Tanakh, of the, the law. The first five books. Moses wrote them. He obeyed God. He said, this Bible is a memorial. Christian, you got a memorial of God in your hand. You need to appreciate it and hold on to it and love it because this is God's way of reminding you that he did something. He said, write it. This for a memorial and a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So God said, I want you to write these stories down, and Moses did. And um, he would made an altar here. In verse 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. You know what Nisi means? A banner. And uh, he said, write it in a book. You know what this is? This is your banner. Hold your banner high. Over there in Russia, they're holding up signs that say Z on them. And they're marching in the streets like Nazis with the letter Z. This is a rise of something, fascism, just like Nazism. Whenever Hitler came into power, they, he made all those signs. They had banners. Christians, if you don't hold up your banner, expect to see more fascist banners in our country. More banners of the wicked, gender confusion, uh, CTR, critical race theory, CRT. Sister Hannah. Yeah. Well, he wants to destroy them. He had. He's going to get them later on. He will do that. Not the remembrance of like in your mind, but the the actual flesh and blood. There would be gone. You can't look on them. So remembrance here doesn't necessarily mean like something you think about in your mind and remember back. It's talking about I will destroy them and they won't be seen or, or you won't have any more um, you know vi visual ability to see. They're going to be gone. He's going to put out their uh, what is the word? Heritage. Their Progenitors, they're gone. He's saying one day I'm going to get them back for this. Uh, it's not done yet. It's promised to be done in the future. And he will do it through uh, David. Because Saul failed to do it. God told him to, to do it for what they did to him. And Saul spared Agag. Was it Agag? And he didn't uh, fulfill the will of the Lord. And for that he lost the kingdom. And that was God's second chance to Saul. He gave him a chance once to wait for Samuel, and he didn't wait seven days. And then he got premature, and God says, all right, now I want you to fulfill what I said back there. Get rid of these people and destroy them. I, I'll remember what they did. And, they, and what, what does it say? Uh, the remembrance of Amalek. Maybe it's his aunt remembrance. Maybe not God's remembrance of Amalek. See, remember the word of is, can go both ways. Follow that through. Maybe that's what it is. That will help you. But it's like Amalek remembers. We got the victory of you. And God said, no, I'm going to wipe out your remembrance. You're gone. And when you're dead, you don't remember nothing. <laughs> that might help you. Because that's a good way. That's one way you look at it. Um, you say the love of God. Uh, do you have the, how many have the love of God here? Okay. Does that mean you love God? How many love God? Or is that God's love in you? You have the love of God, his love in you. That thing goes both ways. So when you say the remembrance of Amalek, it might be Amalek's remembrance. And what they did to the Israelites. And God says, yeah, you keep puffing yourself up and you remember what you did and you remember what you did. Well, guess what? You're not going to remember no more in the grave because I'm going to wipe you people out. So that would be a good way to look at it. Um, let's fit and wrap it up here. Then uh, we got no time, really. So there's, a, there's one in Joshua 4.4 4 I want you to look at. And we're going to look at it because it's, one of the, it's like an ordinance. Joshua will wrap up here this morning. Joshua 4.4. 4. They go through the river Jordan, and it's a picture of death. The word Jordan means overflowing judgments. The word Dan means judgment. 
Daniel means God is my judge. Dan E L L. And any one of those names that end with L, like Ezekiel, L is God. So Daniel is God is my judge. Dan, Dan is judgment. The tribe of Jan, Dan means judgment. And so here you have Jordan, and what it is is God judged your sins, and he wanted them to take some rocks off the land of promise and put them in the river. And I won't go through the whole story for time, but, and then he was said, take some of the rocks out of the river, 12 stones, and bring them into the land of promise. And that's an interesting story there. And if you look at that thing and you study that thing out, it's a picture of you have a promise over in glory. God took you through judgment. And he says, you'll never go into judgment. You're passed from death unto life. And he takes your stones. He takes you out of the river. And it's a picture of resurrection, bringing you into the promised land someday. And it's a memorial. He said, I want you to take these 12 stones now and bring them up on the dry land into the land of promise. And I brought you through to remember that I brought you through. Sort of like coming through the Red Sea. And, and here in Judges chapter, I mean, uh, jo Joshua, I'm in Judges. We'll have to wrap up. Joshua 4, we'll read 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan. And take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. So each one of them took one stone for each 12 tribe. And this, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. When you get baptized, you're testifying to something. When you go into the water, the Lord's promised you that one day the waters are going to open. That ground is going to open. And your body's coming up. Amen. And you're coming through to eternal life. And you've got victory over Pharaoh and his armies. You've got victory over death. And your body, you've got another body on the other side. You're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when you get baptized, you're testifying, I'm dead and buried. And I'm risen a new creature in Christ. And I've got a new body waiting for me on the other side in the land of promise, in glory. And I'm coming through the judgment. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your memorials. Thank you for the burning bush. Thank you for the Lamb of God. Thank you for the unleavened bread. Thank you, Lord, for the victory over the Amalekites and the altar of Jehovah Nisi and the banner of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the priesthood and the, and the umen and the thummim and the, the, the jewels on the shoulder of the breastplate that were a memorial that we as a holy priesthood of God's people can go before your throne and pray. And thank you for the testimony of Mary who anointed your head with oil for the burial and belief in the resurrection. That our faith is a testimony of a memorial like hers, Lord. That wherever the gospel is preached, it will be a memorial of her testimony. And we thank you for these, this Memorial Day. Thank you for the serving uh, soldiers and airmen and the, the Navy and the Marines. Those uh, sailors and Marine Corps uh, men and women all around the world, laying down their lives, willing to serve their country, Lord. Thank you for them. Thank you for those that laid down their lives and gave the ultimate sacrifice to protect us. Thank you for this Memorial Day weekend. We pray you'll bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.